Hey there, welcome to the Marketing Happy Hour podcast, where each week we're learning career-defining advice, powerful social media strategies, unique creative tips, groundbreaking influencer marketing tactics, and more from marketing experts that represent some of the world's leading brands. Let's dive in, grab a drink, and join your hosts, Cassie and Erica, for this week's episode. Hey, Marketing Happy Hour listeners. This week, we're doing something we've never done before. We're welcoming back one of our season one guests to share updates on her business and a fresh perspective on a new topic. Listen in as brand collaboration coach and content creator Kaylee and Nicole shares her proven strategies for launching and scaling an online course, the importance of an email list and nurturing your existing audience, how to lead with value, the tech stack she uses to grow her business, and her expert predictions for the future of influencer marketing. Cassie and I have been friends with Kalia for years and love cheering her on every step of the way, so we were super excited to invite her back to share with you again. If you haven't listened to her season one episode, you might want to pause here, click the link in the show notes, listen in, and then come back. Kaylee is a wealth of knowledge and you won't want to miss a thing. Grab a drink and settle in for this week's Marketing Happy Hour conversation. Hey, Kalia, how are you? I'm doing so well. How are you? I am doing great. We had you on the podcast almost a year ago now, which is insane. And since then, you have been up to quite a lot. You got married, you relaunched your course, you hired a CMO, which is insane. Congrats on all of that. (laughs) (laughs) We have so much to catch up on, but before we do, I have a question for you that I think you can anticipate what I'm going to ask you, but (laughs) Kalia, what is in your glass this evening? Yes, we are getting crazy today with some uh, water with fresh orange and lemon juice. Got to add the citrus in there. (laughs) I like that. So I've always just added the actual fruit, but I like the idea of adding a little bit of juice to it. That's great. Yes. People know by now who listen to the show, I'm always double fisting. I have an Olipop and I also have my water bottle, which has one of your stickers on it. So (gasps) always repping. I love (laughs) Wow. Yes. That just made my whole day. <laughs> so, so I'm great. always repping. I am always repping. Yeah. Oh, I it's love super it. cute. I love I the love sticker. That. Yay. <laughs> I love that so much. Also, I need oh. to know what flavor is the Olipop? Important um, question. Yes. So today is root beer. I Ooh. switch between root beer and the vintage cola. I'm a huge Olipop fan. I Ooh, love yeah, them. They're good. They are yeah. really, they are definitely one of those brands that are worth the hype. <laughs> Yes. And you posted about them the other day about some of their influencer marketing tactics they've been trying recently, which was so fun to dive into too. I was prompted to go over to their page and kind of see what they've been up to. And so, um, love that tie in as well. They're killing it. Yeah, they really are. Yes. Yes. Well, we'll catch up here a little bit more in a second, but can you just share with me what's the latest of the Kaylee and Nicole brand? What have you and the team been up to? Yeah. So as of lately, we have actually been prepping for our mini course launch. So you may know that we have a signature program called network to net worth. Well, for the last like year, you know, our community has been like, we love that, but is there like a more affordable option for someone just starting out? Or is there, you know, something that is just for beginners? Like I'm literally just beginning. I have no idea what I'm doing. What are like the main three things that I need to know or need to master? So we decided to create a mini course and we're calling it network to net worth light L I T E. So we're launching that. And so that's going to be something that's also evergreen. You know, to date, we have always had like open and closed cart for network to net worth, which is the main overall big program. And so, you know, you open, it opens at a certain time, closes at a certain time. And then between that, you can't really get in. And so into in light is going to be completely evergreen. So we're going to launch it. We're going to have like, you know, the exclusive bonus offers for launch week but then we're going to actually keep it open. So anyone that wants to join at any time can actually get in. So we've been working on all of that for that launch. We've also been adjusting our social media strategy because um, TikTok is my new favorite platform. (laughs) A little late to the bandwagon here, but 
been loving TikTok. And so we've been kind of adjusting just how I structure my weeks to make more time to create content on there. And then lastly, we've actually been setting the foundations for a whole new business endeavor that we're hoping to launch by the end of the year. It'll be pretty low key, but that's been taking up a lot of our time too, in a really good way. That is so exciting. And I cannot wait to continue to stay in touch with everything you all have going on. You all have been killing it. Uh, but one thing (laughs) you're welcome. One thing specifically, I would love to ask about the light version of the course that you're creating, you know, for you all, you mentioned that you open and close the full course at different times throughout the year. I work with some people who have a course that's available all throughout the year. You can get in any time you can sign up. It's an annual membership that kind of thing. What have you all seen as the benefit of creating those launches uh, throughout the year that are open and closed? Like you said, very intentional timelines for those things versus just having a course that's available all the time. Yeah. I mean, I'll share kind of the pros and cons because to date, we've always had it open and closed cart. Moving forward, actually, after our upcoming launch in the fall, we're planning to keep the cart open and I'll share why. So, so previously, we've always done open and closed cart because we really liked the, the opportunity for people to have like that urgency where it's like, all right, into an only opens two times a year. And so it really encouraged people to take the leap, to invest in themselves, to invest in their business and not like second guess it, you know, and be like, oh, but like, ah, I can get it anytime. And like, you know, it's like, we were playing on like the FOMO of urgency a lot because there's not scarcity with the course because you can have as many people in there as you want, you know, there's no limit there. So we were trying to play up, you know, just the urgency of that and also be able to really nurture the students that we got inside during that time, because they need a lot more. Like when you first join, you have a lot more questions. You need a lot more attention. We wanted to be able to intentionally provide that for all the students. And then the third reason is that we wanted to really be able to adjust the course in between those launch periods. So we are constant, like we have over, I think it's at this point, like 25 guest speakers in the course. And that's a really cool aspect of, of into and as a whole is you learn not only from me, but from all these guest speakers. So we need time to reach out to do those interviews and schedule them and do the questions and host them and then record them. And then, you know, put them in the course. And then we're also adding lessons that I'm teaching solo. So I'm having to you know, figure out from our students, Hey, what are you wanting to see in there? What do you want a lesson on Then I'm scripting those videos? I'm creating the slides for them, doing the actual filming of them and then getting them up into the course. So we're constantly updating the course, like into when is unlike any other course, because about influencer marketing and working with brands, because a lot of these courses that are on the market is they make it one time and they're like, woohoo, now we can sell this for the next like five years. And it's like, no, influencer marketing is changing, not only like year over year, but like every six months, every three months, like it is constantly changing. And so I want all my students to have the most up-to-date, fresh information. But when we constantly have it open, you know, it, it was like, I don't, I just don't know how I can keep up with the influx of guest speakers that we're wanting to invite in and the new lessons that I want to do. So now the question that you might be asking is, okay, well, Kaleo, why are you planning on keeping it open? Considering those three reasons, why are you keeping it open then after this launch? Well, the issue that we've been running into is listening to community feedback is sometimes they just can't get in during those two launches. And so they missed it. And I've had students that are like, for the last two years, I've missed it because either something comes up or the paycheck I was hoping to get, I didn't get it. Or I had another financial obligation that took priority or for whatever the reason might be, you know, they're not able to get in and they're missing this opportunity to land paid deals. And that really hit me differently. Cause I was like, wow, I, I don't want you to miss the opportunity. You know, like I, I wanted you to be able to get in when it works for you. And so our plan is when we launch this in the fall, we're going to have a steady like launch week. We're still going to do our wait list launch for the email. We're still going to do a social media push. We're going to do a whole thing. We're going to have the bonuses. It's going to be a, a big rah, rah, rah situation like we always do, but we're going to keep the car open. And then moving forward, we're probably still going to have two live launches a year where we'll do like exclusive bonuses, exclusive content drops. Maybe it's a live event situation. I don't know. Like we have a lot of different ideas of what that could look like, 
just to like have those extra incentives to join in during a certain period of time. But in between all of that, if you're like, oh my gosh, I got a bonus from my job and I've been wanting into and for forever, you don't have to wait until the next launch to get it. You can get it immediately. It also gives us the opportunity to run a funnel for into in because if we try to run funnels and do paid ads for into in right now, you would have to just join the wait list. You can't actually get the final product, the final offer, right? You would have to be on the wait list to get it. So we're wanting to get into like paid advertising, which we've never done before. Everything we've done in the last seven years has been completely organic. So there's all these things that we're just like wanting to scale and grow and we can't keep into and close cart if we don't do that. And so we've made a plan for how I can still keep up with adding new content, doing new guest speakers, while also incorporating paid advertisement, you know, and creating a funnel for into in within that and being able to like manage it all. I feel like I'm finally at a place in my business where I can do all of those things without feeling overwhelmed and that I'm not like being intentional with students that come in. That's awesome. And I love how you mentioned too, just keeping that cart open, how you can still do those relaunches per se. Yes. So the positive thing I've seen about building out courses for clients is once the actual, the full foundation of the course is built out, you have your emails written for launches, you have emails for onboarding written. That's the bulk of the work that you have to do. Now, if you keep your cart open and you still want to do those relaunches, um, let's just say in the spring or in the fall, of each year, you have the base of that information already completed, maybe tweak it a little depending on new trends in the industry or new information that's added, but a bulk of your work is finished. You just have to kind of tweak for those relaunches. So that's a really great strategy to put into play, whether you're closing your cart or keeping it open, continue to do those relaunches, add new content, like you said, and get people excited about those courses as you continue to talk about them. Yes, absolutely. With these courses in in general, you know, when I first met you, you didn't have a course, you were kind of breaking (laughs) into the industry. What was that decision like to actually create the course, um, back when you first established it and how have you been able to better serve your community with that course? Yeah. So what's really interesting about network to net worth is it actually didn't start as a self-paced course. It started as a group coaching program. And that's because I, got into the industry in 2015 by like 2017 into 2016, early 2017, I was starting to get a lot of questions from my audience on like, how are you landing these paid deals? And how are you doing negotiations? And what do the contracts look like? And what are the legalities and taxes and all these things on like the business side of becoming a content creator. And in just in general, the entire process of working with brands, it is still to this day, but was especially more so previously in 2017, it, it, there's just so much gatekeeping in the industry. So I started getting all these questions and I was like, you know what, I'm going to start a program where I can kind of take these girls under my wing, teach them how I'm doing things, kind of show them the ropes, give them the experience, the knowledge that I've gained in the last couple of years and, you know, help them land paid deals. Well, that started to, it was going really well and more and more people wanted to join. And I had to cap the group coaching program at like 20 because I, that's at capacity. You know, that's already like a lot of people to really invest in. And I am super, super intentional about the students that I'm taking under my wing. Like I want to invest in them. I want to, you know, give work with excellence. Like I really want to show up for them. I take it very seriously. If someone's investing in anything that I'm offering and they're spending their hard-earned money on what I've created. So we got to the point where we were maxing out and I was having to turn people away from being in the group coaching program. And I like broke my heart. Cause I was like, no, no, no. But like, I want you in this, but like, I can't out of my capacity, like I'm at capacity, you know, to be able to invite you in. And so I had the idea of doing it as a self-paced course to number one, invite more people in and number two, to make it more financially accessible for creatives. Because when it was a group coaching program, y'all, it was like three to four K a person because again, I'm giving so much one-on-one time. And now we have into N as a self-paced course and it's 1497. And so it's more financially accessible. We have different payment plan options that are lower on monthly payments. Anybody, there's no cap on who can join in a certain launch period or if the car is open all the time. And so that was like the main reason why we decided to launch it and kind of how it came to be in terms of how it's allowed us to serve our, like my community is it's really just allowed me to meet them where they're at and give them the entire step-by-step process. And 
And one of my favorite things about what Intuin helps students do is it helps them be more successful than I've ever been. Like I have majority of my students make more than I ever have with brand collaborations because I've taken the last seven years of what I've learned. I've put it into you know, a 12 module course, teaching them everything, giving them the guest speakers. And so they're going to be starting in their first year, seven years, basically in to their creative journey, because they've taken everything I've learned. So like, they're way further along, they're, you know, making six figures, some of them are making six figures in their first year after taking into it. And so it's like, it's just been so cool to watch that and and see them be even more successful, successful than I have been. That's like my biggest, <laughs> I'm like, I'm so proud, you know, please be do even better than I've done. You know, that's really the goal of why I created it. And so there's just, again, there's so much gatekeeping in the influencer marketing industry, you know? And so for me, it's just such a huge blessing and honor to have been able to create the course and offer that to creatives that, you know, really want to succeed in this area, but aren't sure of how to turn this from, you know, a hobby and something that they just kind of do as like a side hustle or a small revenue stream into like a full fledged business that could be their full-time income or could, you know, have them leaving their current job and doing this content creation thing full time. So it's just, it's a huge blessing for me. I love it. It's awesome being able to just meet them where they're at and give them everything that they need to know, literally everything they need to know in one place versus like, oh my gosh, I got to Google it and look on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and like try and gather all this information. It's like, no, you just, all you need, literally all you need, if you're starting out as a creative is in two in, and that's how I've designed it from the beginning. Amazing. And you mentioned earlier too, how you've brought in professionals from different industries to lead to helping these creatives yeah. build their business, not just have the tools to launch into the influencer marketing space and to land collaborations, but no, how can they take that? They can start landing these partnerships, but they can also quit their jobs and do this full time and run a business and, you know, make this bigger you know, you could have stopped there, but you're adding more and more value to these creatives to where they have the confidence to move forward and do what you're doing to work for themselves and have that financial freedom, which is, is so amazing. Um, and I think course creators sometimes forget that that's an opportunity to bring in different collaborators to create an even bigger value add to these students yes. in these courses. Yeah. It's been, I, I, I always get all my students. Cause I'm like, what, what's your favorite lesson, you know, or what's your favorite thing. And they're like, we love the guest speakers. And I was like, y'all really <laughs> like, you gotta throw me under the bus like that. They're yeah. like, no, we love your stuff, Kalia. But like, it's just, it is that extra value. Cause it's like, I know what I know about the influencer marketing industry, but I'm not a CPA. I don't know exactly how to do your taxes. I'm not a lawyer. You know, I know my way around a good contract, but I'm not legally certified. I didn't take a board or whatever the yeah. test is for lawyers. Okay. I didn't take that. You know, I'm not, I don't have a podcast. You know, we've had you in there to talk about, you know, building a podcast. I, you know, there's so many, any topic you can think of when it comes to growing your business or leveraging that, you know, paid speaking opportunities, having the podcast, you know, anything that you could think of, we've covered that and in into in. And if we have it, our students will request it and we make it happen. And that's the biggest thing is like, we've built into in directly based off of students' feedback. It's not what I think you need to know. You know, it is what I'm like, this is actually what I know you need to know. And here's what the other experts say you need to know, but it's not just based on that. It's like, what do you have questions about? Like, what are you coming up against that you're frustrated with, or you're not sure how to overcome or navigate or respond to, you know, let's make a video about that. And so we have very specific individualized lessons and within into in and it's just a step-by-step -step process, you know? And so it's like, yeah, the, the guest speakers are a great addition. You could go through the entire course, just watching my videos and have everything that you need, you know, to be successful. But the great thing is like, one of my favorite testimonials that one of our students said from Intuin is that Intuin constantly revalidates their investment because we're always adding new content and new guest speakers. You just get so much more than, oh, this is just about how to land paid brand partnerships. I want to teach you how to be a successful CEO, business owner, entrepreneur as a whole. Awesome. Yes. It's, it's so, so good. And one aspect of your launches and your course as well is an email list. So I'm a part of your email list. I saw when the emails came through for the course, I love following different people's <laughs> lists and just seeing how they yeah. utilize email. Cause email is such a powerful tool. You know, we had Carson who I know we both know and love on love um, the podcast. 
she shared all of the ins and outs of building an email list, but for you specifically one, how has an email list come into play for your launches? And then two, just in general, any tips for building and nurturing an email list for your brand? Yeah. So to cover the first question of, you know, what role did it play a part y'all? I mean, the email list is what allows us to make six figures from our launches for into n It's not just because of social media. Yes, that plays a huge role. And I think that there's a huge misconception that because I do have, you know, a, a community online, that that's the reason I, you know, quote unquote, make the money that I do, right. Or have the launches that I do. It's like, no, we actually, you know, have our email list and we're constantly nurturing them and running our emails very intentionally to have these great launches. Like that is where the majority of our revenue for the course is coming from. So what we do when it comes to the launch and the role that it email list plays within that is we have a wait list specifically for end to end. So there is over a thousand people that are on there that are just like waiting for us to open the doors again. So to just honor the fact that they have signed up for that list, we launch whenever we launch into end when we open the cart, we launch it to them first. We give them first access, which also means they get access to bonuses first. A lot of times we do limited capacity bonuses. So like the first 10 people or the first 25 people. So we give them the chance to take advantage of those first before we ever launch it publicly to honor the fact that they joined the wait list. So we do that. Typically what we've done like previously, and we're not going to do this in the fall is we'll do like a whole week that's a waitlist launch. And then the second week is a public launch, but I was getting so exhausted by like the end of the first week. And then I still had a whole nother week to publicly show up. And I was like, y'all, I just can't do this. And so I've done that like for the last, I think four or five launches. When we do our launch this fall, we're only going to do probably like a few days for the waitlist. And then, you know, like I probably will launch for a week as a whole. So it might be like two or three days for the waitlist and the rest of it will be public. So we're, we're cutting that. All right. So I don't recommend <laughs> a whole two week situation. Cause it's a lot and you get really tired from showing up. But yeah, I would say like in terms of building and like nurturing that list, like how, how did we get it to that point? Number one, we talk about it all the time, you know, especially with the wait list, you have a course and you do a wait list for your course, talk about it, share about it, put the link on your stories, bless it. We can all have links on our IG stories now. Right. So it's like, post that out there. Like people are going to sign up for an email list that they don't even know exists. They don't know it's there, you know, so let them know, like, don't be shy to share it. And also like, let them know what the incentive is for joining. You know, they're going to, my wait list is, they know the first, they're the first to know when we're releasing it again. They're the first to know about the bonuses, how many there are. They're the first to get those bonuses. You know, they get all the deals, you know, they are the VIPs. And so we really explain what the incentive is for joining to get them to convert and actually join the wait list. So number one, when just building your list in general is talk about it. Number two is offer freebies that are high converting for them. Not necessarily just high converting for you, but high converting for them. So something that they can see almost like immediate results with our number one freebie is my free pitch template. We've had over 3,500 people sign up for that one freebie alone. That's it. And, and for perspective, we actually just this month hit 6,000 subscribers on our list. So that's over half have signed up for that one freebie. And the reason is, is because they get it. They start landing deals because it's a template. They can easily implement it like boom, right away. They get it. They start landing deals. Then they tell their friends about it. Now their friends are signing up. Then they, they have stories. They're posting stories about this template saying, oh my gosh, this landed me my first paid partnership. Like you didn't get it, you know? So now word of mouth is, is coming to play in all of this, right? So it's like our second highest freebie is another set of templates on how to respond to collaborations. Biggest question. One of the biggest questions I get is how do I turn gifted collabs into paid collabs? Well, I made templates for you. So we have those as a freebie that you can sign up for. And again, it's easy to implement. It immediately solves a problem. Like pay attention to the questions you're being asked. You know, like what is the number one? If you grouped all the questions together and you, what's the one that you constantly see coming up? I constantly see, what do you say in a pitch email? What do you say in a pitch email? What do you say? How do you turn gifted into paid? How do you turn? So we made two freebies around the most common questions that we get from our community, right? So really listen and pay attention to what they're saying. And then I would say the third thing when it comes to, you know, nurturing is actually nurture, like actually nurture your audience and provide value consistency is like everyone, mo not everyone, but most people stop at the building stage and they're like, great, we've built the list. And then they never hear from you again. You don't want to be like the companies on black Friday where it's like, they're posting their sales, sales, sales. Here's our sale. Here's our sale. And you're like, wait a minute. 
I'm on their email list. Like I've never gotten another email from them after, like I signed up for the 15% off free coupon and I haven't heard from them since. And now they're trying to sell me on their black Friday deal or whatever deal that is. Okay. Don't be that kind of company, right? Don't be that brand. You know, we send out two emails every week on a Monday and a Friday. When we launch, we're sending out, you know, obviously more because we're in like a sales sequence there, but our nurture sequence is two emails a week. Even if you just started with, you know, two emails a month or one email a week, like something that you can maintain consistently where you're providing value, that's going to build your trust. It's going to build your authority. Like you are going to convert so many more people via email than you are social media. Let's just be honest. Like our conversion yeah. rates are like, they're so much higher for email. Cause I'm directly in your inbox you know, like you made the conscious decision, not only to like, it's different than on social media. They just click a button, they follow you and then they might see your content again. But if they're on your email, like you're, you've just like integrated into a very sacred space, their inbox. Okay. And so like, that's a really intentional decision that they made to have you on there. And so if you just like give them a freebie, but then you don't deliver anything after that and you completely fall off the face of the earth, they're not going to, you're not building any trust or credibility or authority with them. And ultimately that's going to hurt when you do want to sell because they're like, who are you? And I'll give another quick example of that. You know, we just had a, a video go viral on TikTok last week. And I had a lot of people that were like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Like the mini course is launching. Like, what do you think you're going to do? Are you going to, you know, do a bunch of videos about the mini course on your TikTok? And I was like, honestly, I don't know. Maybe I'll do one, but people were like, why wouldn't you talk about it? Like you just now grew a bigger audience and they're all creatives. And I was like, because people there don't trust me yet. I'm not going to ask them for a sale when I have no, no authority and credibility and trust with them yet, because this just happened, you know? And that was the issue is like everyone, you know, there's people going viral a lot and all these videos picking up about UGC and UGC is, it, it was about UGC, the video that went viral. And I was seeing all these other people responding and being like, oh, great. Everyone's going viral about UGC and, and making this whole thing about, oh, it's so easy to make money and it's a get rich quick scheme. And it's like, people are like, is this a cult? Is this an MLM? Is this like, well, you know, whatever. And I was like, that's the issue though, is everyone was like, oh my gosh, get into UGC and like, oh, buy my free guide, buy my course, sign up for my freebie. And it's like, no. And that's why I was like, I'm not going to go into this. I'm just going to go into this providing value, 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 value. Then I'm going to ask for a sale, but not before I probably provided 50 things of value first. You know, like, I think that's a huge mistake people just make when it comes to email list is like, here's the freebie. Great. Okay. Also, can you buy this for me? It's like from them, for them to jump from something zero to paying me $1,500 for a course. And there was no connection in between, no value in between via email specifically, like that's a problem. So that would be like, my biggest thing is like, what's your number one tip for nurturing? Make sure you nurture. <laughs> I love it. Well, we think about to a marketing funnel, right? So people start yeah. at the top and they have to be trickled down through nurturing and, you know, different pieces of content and value adds people don't go from the top of the funnel to the bottom immediately ready no. to purchase as soon as they learn about you. So exactly. I love how you kind of walked through that process that you all take, because like you said, brands and personal brands, we don't think about that. A lot of people don't think about, okay, um, I have to build that trust with these people first before I ask them to spend any sort of money on my products and my services. And so that's a great reminder for email, for social, for really any channel that you're using for marketing is just nurture, push people down the funnel in a natural, intentional way, and you will get people to buy from you. Yeah. And then when you do ask for the sale, they're like, literally sign me up, which is yeah. what happens with end to end because I spend so hours and hours and hours and hours daily, weekly, monthly, providing free content, giving free value all the time that if they're getting results for my free content, I hear this all the time. I get so many results from your free content. I can't even imagine if I paid you. That's, that's yep. the kind of response that you're wanting from your community that you, you it's like the whole TikTok, like take my card, take my card right now. Like take my card. Yeah. Like where can I sign up? Like, I'll give you anything. When do you need my information? Can you take it in advance? Right? Like just take it because they're just ready. You know, I'm not constantly. And I've also structured my launches in such a way where I'm not constantly asking for a sale. What I ask for a sale in between our big launches are like Amazon storefront, or I'm working with brands, right. Where it's a lot easier of an ask, or it's a lot more affordable, but you gotta, you gotta provide the value. Always, always lead with value because then when it comes time for you to ask for the sale, your audience is going to be ready and they're going to give you their credit card information. You know, they're gonna be like, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> Yeah. And with 
you know, those free value ads too, that you were talking about a lot of people that I've worked with have mentioned to me, Oh, what if I'm giving away too much? What if what I'm sharing with people? Yeah. And so they get worried about creating lead magnets or creating those downloadable files or any of those resources that you're creating. And I tell them, I said, um, obviously there's way more than just a single document that you can provide to someone, but it's that single value adder, that free resource that you provide to someone that builds that trust. It gets people to say, wow, you know, there's so much more where this came from. If they can provide value in this small document or whatever they're providing, imagine how much this course, like you said, is going to be able to provide for me. So I would say for people, you know, lead magnets, for example, is a great way to get people onto your list, but don't be afraid to give away too much. And also you're there to serve a community. So why not provide some sort of value to them? And then later down the road, yeah, if you want, if you want them to purchase something from you, they certainly will, but that's that kind of piece that helps get people engaged with what you're doing and really excited about what you're offering down the road too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And small plug really quick for your pitch template. I love it. And hilarious story really quick. (laughs) So, um, I used it for myself. My husband has his own company and the other day he was, uh, working to reach out to this brand to do a partnership, his Instagram for his business is growing. And he said to me, he goes, what do I do? How do I write this email? And I said, hold on. I have a great resource for you. And I sent him your pitch template and he used it. So yeah. So small plug. I love it. Highly recommend going to download it if you haven't already. Um, but it's great. So great resource you offer there. Yeah. And, and just to kind of play off of that, you know, I, I love that he loved it. I'm so glad (laughs) that you love it too. That, that makes my day, but the, the interesting part of that is like, yes. So I've given you now a template with all the verbiage you know, and, and like, here's what you should say. And here are some ideas on what that could look like. But for example, if you were in my course, any of my students could send me their pitch and I could review it, but I'm not going to do that publicly. It's like, I'll tell you, you know, here's like the framework of what you need to say, but that's also the difference between free versus paid, you know, or for example, I might teach you what you need to be charging for, but I might not be, I'm not teaching you publicly exactly how much, or the equations that I teach my students behind the scenes on how to figure out exactly what their rate is for each piece of sponsored content that they're creating, right? So it's sometimes it's like, here's the why, but not necessarily the how. And that sometimes how I'll differentiate between like what's free and then what's paid content. But I give, I, people get on me all the time because they're like, oh, you share too much publicly. You share, too, oh my gosh. And I'm like, no, nope, I don't because I'm still, I'm not having a problem. It actually gets people to trust me more because they're like, oh, you're not gatekeeping. You're not holding anything back. And I'm like, well, why would I? I'm also extremely confident that when you get into end to end or you get into into end light that no, you're not going to just see repeats of all the free content. It is a much deeper level. There is so much more depth inside my courses and what I share for free. And so it's like also just having that confidence to know that you can separate free versus paid and still see a lot of people convert into paid opportunities with you but also just have that confidence in yourself to know that what you're going to be giving behind the scenes in a paid capacity is way more. Like you have so much more to offer than just what you're showing up and sharing on social or on email or through a podcast. Like you have so much more to give. And so just like remain confident in that too. Yes. 100%. Yes. So you mentioned social media a little bit that, and how that plays a part in your launches and just promoting, um, all these different offerings that you have. Do you have any other marketing recommendations for launching a course, things that you, uh, rely on or things that you're planning to test for future launches? Yeah. A big one that we do that I haven't mentioned is we leverage affiliate marketing for all of our launches. So we uh, invite some previous students that have been graduates of our course to be affiliates and make a certain, you know, commission off of anybody that they encourage from their audience to join in. And so that has been massive. I think last launch we got in, I want to say it was like 25 or 30 people from affiliates out of like 78. So that was really, really big. I mean, it's just, you know, it's massive to like, I have a certain web and people that I can reach, but then you like multiply that by 20 to 30 affiliates, which is what we'll usually have. Sometimes it's smaller. Sometimes it's only 10, but even times 10, you know, that's like 10 new audiences. And like one person might have 30 K another person might have 5k. And then it's like, you add all that up. And like, you just increased 
your reach tenfold. Right. And then sometimes like, what's really cool is, you know, we have the whole into and main launch. Well, now we're about to do into and light. We can have, we can kind of pick up anybody that was like, oh, I wanted to join into in, but I couldn't afford it that round. And I feel like I'm just starting out and it's like really robust. And like, do you have anything that's like available? That's a little bit more, you know, easy to like digest for someone that's just beginning. It's like, now we can go reach out to them and I can encourage my affiliates to go reach out to them and say like, Hey, let them know that we have into and light now. And that might be a better fit for them. So affiliate marketing is really, really huge. Another thing is we make sure to do like a nurture period before we launch. So I used to make the mistake. It's funny before we like brought on our CMO, Mia, bless her. I don't know how I ever did anything uh, without her, <laughs> but she was like, Hey, like, so when do you do like your nurture period for launch? And I was like, what are you talking about? I don't know why I didn't think about it. I've been in business for seven years. And I forgot that like, I should be nurturing them in advance, like a couple of weeks in advance before we actually launch, we should be letting them know that this is like coming and what's happening and what the cost is and what they could expect. So for example, in two weeks, we're launching into in light. And so like tonight I'm doing an IG live to be like, Hey, here's the name announcement. Here's the date it's launching. Here's what it's going to cost. Here are the payment plan options. Here are the bonuses. Here's the information that it includes giving them all those details. We have two posts going live next week. Just again, letting them know it's coming. It's happening. Here's the cost. Here's what you can expect. Then we'll do our entire, you know, launch blowout strategy, right? On social media and then through email. So having that like nurture period. And then something that we did that was fun. I'm just kind of throwing a lot of ideas because maybe this will like, as you're listening to this, maybe it'll spark something for you, something you could pursue. We did um, PR boxes. So like in the influencer marketing industry, brands will send PR to their influencers. So because we're a brand partnership course, we were like, how fun would it be if we did like into end PR boxes? So we had these physical pink boxes with into and merch. And that was the sticker. One of the stickers that Cassie was saying is on our water bottle. We had like stickers in there. We had journals, tote bags. We actually collaborated with other brands to have their products in there. Cause again, we were trying to like marry everything together in the brand partnership realm. So then we actually sent out physical boxes in the mail to students that joined the first 50 students that joined. And that was so fun. Everyone was so hype about that. So those are like some of the other big things. I, th I would say like the last one is I always do like a specific launch video like we do a huge film production. And this last launch, we actually had real into and students be part of that video shoot. And then we did a separate photo shoot and had real into and students be part of that one too. So just little things like that, like how can you constantly leverage, you know, the people that have already joined, how can you continue to like invite them into what you're creating and what you're building and what you're launching next? Because odds are they like want to be part of that. And if they love your course, like they want to share about it and tell more people about it, especially if they've seen results. So just like leveraging that, you know, whether that is through affiliate marketing or them being in a photo shoot or a launch video or something like that, there's tons of ways that you can do that. But yeah, those are some fun things that we've done previously in terms of like what we're wanting to do next. You know, when we have it open evergreen, we definitely want to get into, you know, having a funnel and do paid advertisement. But what we want to do for this next launch is SMS marketing. That's like something that we're looking into. Awesome. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to hear your thoughts on that because that is something that I haven't utilized very much in the past. And so I'm always curious. I know it's definitely effective, but I'm so excited to hear about your feedback on that. Cause that's a yeah. word we just don't really talk about at all. No, hardly ever in, in most, marketing. Yeah. In most product and service, like, or not even service. I mean, some services like, you know, massages or brows or lashes, like they use it, but mostly you see it for like products, you know, or big time companies, but I don't see it on like a course level, you mm -hmm. know, for like personal brands. I've not seen it done person. I, I don't, I just haven't seen it done. Um, maybe people are, I'm sure there's people out there doing it, but I, I just haven't yeah. seen it. And so I'm really intrigued to try it out and see what happens, especially because we have such high conversion for email. I'm like, but what if we had their phone number? Like, I'm just really curious that even if we had a line where they can like respond and ask me questions and it like, doesn't go to my direct number, but comes to me, you know, and then I can like actually yeah. like be texting them back about it versus DMing them or emailing them. I'm like, that's so much more personal and just like really cool. So I'm like, I'm just, we're playing around with it. We're looking into different platforms and stuff. So, you know, we'll figure that out. Cause we got, we got some time here. Cause it's not, we're not launching until fall, but yeah, I'll have to keep you updated. Cause I'm really intrigued by it too. <laughs> yeah. And let me know what platform you use too. And I know specifically for text messages, the open rates are insane, which is yeah. awesome. Cause if you think about it, that's where consumers are. They're using your, their phone. And so that's kind of a, a good lesson too, in meeting 
the the client or the customer you're trying to reach where they are. And so that's a pure example of that. But speaking of platforms too, uh, one more question before I want to dive into influencer marketing as a whole here in a second, platform recommendations for courses, for emails. What do you recommend? Yes. Okay. So Flowdesk for emails, hundred percent. I also have a code where you can get 50% off and yes, I am plugging my affiliate code in this podcast. Okay. Um, I am an influencer. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get 50% off. I love Flowdesk. It's super user-friendly. It's easy to set up. I do not, I hate every other email marketing platform because <laughs> they're ugly inside and they're difficult to figure out and they're time consuming. And it's just Flowdesk is so, so easy. I love it. Um, with my code, you can get it for $19 a month. So it's also really affordable and they don't penalize you the more you grow your list. So like the rate I pay right now is going to be the same rate I pay if I had 10,000 people on there, 20,000 or 30,000. I love Flowdesk for that reason. That's a huge, huge incentive for my course. I host everything in Kajabi. Now I pay like 200 a month for Kajabi because I also, they have the affiliate program and platform within Kajabi and I leverage affiliate marketing. So that's a big thing. And then another one that my friend Natasha mentioned is you can now run a podcast, like a private podcast from Kajabi. I just found out about this. You might be listening and you're like, I've known that Kalia. This is news to me. Okay. So you can run a private network. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take into and into and light and put on this private podcast situation. So then our students can listen to it instead of having to log into the course and like actually watch the entire videos. But yeah, that's what we use for the course load us for email. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. That's really like the main things that we use for the course are those two things. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get the code from you too. We'll put it in the show notes for everyone. Yes, Flowdesk. Yes. I love Flowdesk. I've kind of toggled between Flowdesk and ConvertKit. I didn't know that Flowdesk didn't penalize you for growing your list. So yep. that is good to know. I love yeah. that. Um, but yeah, Kajabi is awesome. I think some people look at the pricing per month and kind of get freaked out, but essentially what you're doing with Kajabi is you're selling tickets. So it's kind of going to pay for itself yes. over time, which is awesome. Yeah. And Kajabi does have so many capabilities. I know they're currently trying to build out their email software as well. Yeah. It's not quite it's to not the there place. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not there it's, yet. it's not quite there. Um, there are certain things that I like to use it for, uh, depending on what that may be. But um, hopefully one day when that does get there, we'll be able to streamline all of our systems and stuff like that. But there's a lot of great automation systems that can kind of pair Kajabi with whatever email platform that you use, which is awesome. Yeah. 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 I also would recommend a, I have ClickUp. So ClickUp is what I use for like, you know, my, my CRM kind of system. And that's where I script all my videos. Cause you can have documents in there. So I'll put, you know, all my scripts in there. I'll assign tasks to my team for like graphic design or any emails that we need to have for launches and stuff. Like that's where I manage. Like that is a look inside my brain is if you look inside ClickUp, you know, that's where I manage everything and that I communicate with my team. And so those are like the main things that we're using during launch period. And then we'll also use Voxer to communicate with affiliates. So that way we're not like texting them, but we're also not emailing them or DMing them. So we'll use Voxer, which is just like a walkie talkie app, um, that you can also send text on. So it's not like you just do voice messages, but you can also send like text and stuff on. So those are like the main things that we use during launches. Awesome. Okay. Kalia, let's talk about influencer marketing for a minute. Your wheelhouse. What, <laughs> <laughs> what trends are you currently seeing in the space? Is there anything that brands need to pay attention to right now for their upcoming campaigns that they're building? Yeah. I mean, you've probably seen it all over TikTok recently is UGC, 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 UGC is user generated content. Listen, it's not new. This has been around for years. Okay. It's just becoming more mainstream and people are realizing what it is and like the capabilities and the opportunities within that space. But there are a lot of brands are also coming awake to this whole new opportunity of how they can partner with creatives because UGC is more affordable than influencer marketing, you know, as a whole, like hiring influencers is typically more pricey than hiring someone to create 
user generated content for you because they don't have to post the UGC on their page. So their brand's not leveraging, you know, that creative's audience and having to pay for that exposure as well. So huge shift towards UGC. I would say a second thing is brands wanting to work with more micro influencers than because they're converting better than people that are macro or celebrities, right? You know, there's definitely a place for every marketing objective that a brand has, but I am seeing a huge shift towards brands realizing like, wow, people under 50 K and even nano influencers, creatives under 10 K they're, they're really giving us a lot of ROI. This is interesting. And it's like, well, we've been trying to tell you that for like the last 10 years and you're just now picking up, but we're seeing a, a great shift towards that. Third thing is, you know, there's a lot of talk right now is like, are we about to hit a recession? There's a recession looming, you know, all that discussion. Well, brands are actually increasing budgets considering that, you know, quote unquote, what, whatever you believe that a recession is looming or it's not, no one really knows, but brands are actually increasing budgets because a lot of the brands are seeing that working with creatives is driving a higher ROI and a return on their per dollar investment than investing in paid ads. So that's been really intriguing. And so I was seeing like some articles about brands and they've increased like their influencer marketing budget, like 20% year over year or by like 200 K year over year. It's absolutely ridiculous. A lot of, a lot of people have like the misconception that, you know, the influence marketing industry is too saturated and no brands aren't paying, you know, creatives anymore. And there's not money in this. And it's like, I think we're projected to get to a $16.4 billion industry by the end of this year which is wild. So it's only growing year after year after year. It's only getting bigger and bigger. And so the last thing that I would say with, with those things being said is that brands are wanting to invest in longer term relationships versus just one-off campaigns. They're really seeing the value of having, you know, ambassadors for their brand or doing a six month collaboration or a year long partnership versus just an Instagram reel here or a TikTok there or something. So it also makes their job easier because they're managing maybe five to 10 creatives over a year basis versus, you know, 30 plus, let's say, depends on the brand. But yeah, I would say those are like the four big things to be paying attention to and be mindful of if you are a brand or if you're a creative listening to this and you're like, you know, where is the industry going? What are the current shifts? That's kind of what I'm seeing. Awesome. And you've talked a little bit about TikTok throughout this interview, and you've shared that TikTok is one of your go-to platforms right now. How have you seen that that platform has differed from Instagram in terms of strategy? And then any tips for creators and brand collaborations on the brand or creator side, just any tips for both sides in general? Yeah. So in terms of how it differs, you know, TikTok between IG, TikTok is so much more organic it is not as curated as Instagram. And I've been loving TikTok way more because of that. I've always joked that I am a content creator, but I'm an educational content creator. Like I'm not, I can do the outfit post or the beauty stuff or the skincare, or the home stuff. I can do all of that. And I do love it. But if I had to choose between that and like sharing value or sharing tips and like talking face to camera, that's my jam, you know, like sitting here on this podcast, this is where I'm thriving. Like I love education and teaching. And so I can do that on TikTok way more in a more organic way. Like it, what's interesting is like Instagram compares themselves to TikTok. You know, they're always looking to TikTok. TikTok is actually looking to YouTube and YouTube is longer form video content. And so we're seeing this shift where on TikTok longer form, you know, organic, like original content is performing better than even just doing the trends. Like there's even that kind of shift that's happening on that platform. So when it comes to like content strategy for each of those, for Instagram, it's very planned. I'm creating it in advance. It's curated. It has to be like aesthetically pleasing. I need to pick the right sound and make sure it looks really good. And like, I got my hair and makeup on, you know, hair and makeup on, hair and makeup done. Okay, like <laughs> I gotta make sure the whole situation is good there. So with TikTok, it's like, I felt like I can get on there, no makeup, hair not done, looking crazy and being like, all right, here's the tea. Like, here's what you need to know about this topic. And so with TikTok, I'm creating more in the moment or in response to questions that I'm getting from people that are, you know, in my audience there. Whereas on Instagram, it's more of like, here are the three things and I'm like pointing or the text is popping up or again, it's more aesthetic. So it's just a different strategy. And I think that TikTok is more like natural for me. So I'm gravitating towards it more, but Instagram is my bigger platform where I have a bigger community. And so I can't like not show up there. So it's been like a balance to try and be like, 
I like TikTok more. That's all the only place I want to show up. But also like Instagram is where I'm still getting most of my brand deals and where most people like know me and trust me. And so just balancing those two in terms of like tips for creators, you mean like tips for creators to land brand collaborations or like tips for showing up on the platform? Yeah, I'd say both. So specifically for brand collaborations, if they are looking to build a presence on the platform, find their niche, any tips for doing that specifically on TikTok in order to launch into landing collaborations? Yeah. I mean, there's kind of mixed feedback when it comes to showing up on Instagram versus TikTok. I've heard from, you know, some people that have, you know, millions of followers on TikTok. They're like, just post a bunch of stuff and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. And I kind of went against that by only posting stuff about brand collaborations. And I, you know, had some favor with the video that went viral last week that happened to be about brand collaborations and praise the Lord. It was about what I teach, you know, like a lot of people go viral and it has nothing to do with what they know about or what they teach. And so now the audience that I've been building is directly related to what I can help them with. And so that's not always the case. So that's kind of like what you're risking is if you do post a bunch of different types of content, you know, that's like all over the place. It's like, great. You're testing a bunch of things, which I think is really valuable, but at the same time, you could go viral for something that you don't necessarily want to spend your entire time talking about on TikTok. So like, you're just running that risk. It's just a risk. You know, it's just like, what, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to show up and be known for? I know people that what they talk about on Instagram is completely different than what they talk about on TikTok. You could do that route. I really don't think that there's like a a right or wrong way. You know, what kind of consider too, like what kind of collaborations are you wanting to do? If you're wanting to do a different type of different types of campaigns that you're doing on Instagram, then you're going to want to be creating different kinds of content on TikTok, you know, and then you have a really great opportunity to leverage both platforms. Cause maybe your Instagram is focused on like fashion and beauty. Maybe your TikTok is focused on home and lifestyle. Well, now you can cater to brands from vo- both those industries on different platforms. And so it just, it just opens the door to more things, but I think with, with brands, you know, wanting to land different collaborations or wanting to hire different creatives for collaborations, like what are some things that you should be looking for? You know, I would be looking at, you know, what is their previous experience look like? You know, does the content that they create actually align with the content that you would want to use on your social media or your website or any of the platforms that you have? It's kind of like when you're picking out a photographer, you don't want to pick out a photographer that their editing doesn't align with like your branding and your aesthetic. It's very similar, you know, looking at the creatives, like do their morals and values align with you as a brand, you know, can you stand behind the creators that you're allowing to represent your brand? You know, are you good with that? And so things like that are are really important to know. And just, again, the kind of content that they're creating, if it resonates with you, you know, I see a lot of brands pick creatives just because of following or just because of, mostly just because of following. And it's like, ah, give, give micro influencers, give nano influencers a chance, you know, and making sure that also like my biggest thing is making sure that you're hosting, you know, campaigns that are diverse and are inclusive, you know, that not every single person that you're hiring on for a campaign looks the exact same way. I think brands make that mistake all the time. And, you know, like that doesn't need to be happening (laughs) because there's so many creatives out there that fit the bill in so many areas And so just making sure that you're giving, you know, opportunities out to a diverse group of people and, you know, even diverse groups of, you know, follower counts, you know, that it's not just in, you know, big time celebrities and, and stuff like that. I think just knowing as a brand, what your marketing objectives are for campaigns, if it is for brand awareness, then of course you want to go with, you know, people that have bigger reach, you know, and and reach a larger audience. But if you're really looking for conversions and you haven't tapped into micro influencers and nano influencers, this is your encouragement to look into some. And if you're a brand listening to this and you need recommendations of good creators, let me know. Let me know because that's the entire network that I serve. If you're having, if you're listening to this as a brand and you're having trouble finding good people, good creatives that create great content, convert, that are great to work with, that are professional, that is who I train and raise up through end to end. So like, I'd be happy to connect you with, you know, those types of of creatives that you're looking for that maybe you're having trouble finding, but yeah, I, I would say those would be some of my, my tips for those platforms. 
Thank you. Yes, definitely reach out to Kalia. She is a wealth of information and knowledge, but Kalia, I am so sad that this interview is coming to a close here in a minute, (laughs) but one last question I have for you as we finish up here, do you have any, uh, predictions or upcoming trends that you see are just going to pop off in the space here soon in the influencer marketing world that we should pay attention to? Oh man, that's a, that's a really good question. I would say that we're definitely trending towards brands wanting content creation versus just hiring influencers. I think that there's a huge trend towards content creators versus influencers that brands are now wanting to, and I think will continue to want to leverage specific talents and skill sets that creatives have versus just leveraging the audience that they serve. And that their brand, like their eyes are just being opened. And I think that that's going to continue to happen is as creatives continue to prove themselves to brands, they're going to realize like, wait, we could also use this creative to, you know, host interviews for us at the events that we have. And wait, they also plan events. We, we could definitely have them plan an event or they are crazy great at fashion. What if we collaborated with them to do a fashion line with us? I think that there's going to just be this leveraging of talents and skills that creatives have to offer. But with that being said, if you're listening to this and you're a creative, that means that you need to be very diligent about showcasing to brands what those talents and skill sets you possess are so they can begin to think how they could leverage them. And also don't be afraid to go ahead and and put the ideas right in front of them on a silver platter and say, here's what I can do. Because what happens when I'm building my relationships with brands, long-term relationships is we might start off with a social media post, but like we've been in conversation where we're going to partner directly with a brand to host an event here in Tampa. So I'm constantly looking for ways and saying, oh, you want to do events or, oh, you need someone to interview the country music artist, or you need someone to, I don't know, walk a runway or you like, I'm your girl, I'm your girl. Let me know. You know what I mean? Cause I could do a bunch of things, a bunch of different things for you. And so it's like, you're not one dimensional as a creative. You've always known that if you're listening to this, you're a creative, you've always known that you're not one dimensional. You probably will consider yourself to be multi-passionate. Brands are going to start leveraging that. Make sure that you make yourself available for those opportunities and submit yourself for those opportunities. Even if they don't come to you first, like, don't be afraid to put yourself out there because I really think that brands are going to start to realize like, wow, we can use these creatives for more than just social media content. I am excited to continue watching out for that and just see how the mold of the influencer marketing world is broken in a way. It's such an exciting thing. And thank you for sharing that and definitely follow Kalia along and just continue to see these changes that are happening in the influencer marketing world, both on the brand and creator side. But on that note, Kalia, where can everyone find you online and follow along with everything you're up to? Yes. So IG and TikTok, both of those handles are at Kaylee and Nicole with two E's at the end. I'm sure those will be linked down below, but those are the best best places to reach out to me. Feel free to send me a DM. You know, if you're listening to this on TikTok or on IG, I would love to connect with you. And again, if you're a brand and you want to connect or you're looking for some good creatives, I got a great roster. I'm happy to you know, help you with and, and kind of pair you up with some awesome people. But if there's any way that I can serve you, or if there's any questions that you have after listening to this, please reach out to me. I would love to answer them. Hey, Leah, thank you so much for being a wealth of knowledge for us today. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're loving what you're hearing, please remember to rate and leave a review. I know we say that at the end of every episode, but seriously, it helps us so much and we would truly appreciate your thoughts. Finally, follow us on Instagram and sign up for our Marketing Happy Hour weekly LinkedIn newsletter at the links in the show notes. We can't wait to connect with you.